We're here at the Web Summit, and we're talking about a really interesting topic. And I know you've all been hearing a lot about autonomy and autonomous vehicles aided by AI. And you're always hearing that it's sometime in the future, maybe five years, maybe two years. But we're here on this panel with Peter and Sean to talk about how we have a date now. And that date is not far in the future. But in terms of putting autonomous trucks and commercial deliveries on the road, we're talking about 2027. So that's just around the corner. And these two companies, uh, Plus and Scania, are working together on it. So uh, why don't we start with you, Peter? How you're providing the trucks and, uh, and um, Plus is providing the, uh, the technology. That's how it works, right? We're talking about a module that appears on the truck. It could be any kind of truck, right? Yeah, what, what we do, Scan is creating uh, vehicles out of a modular system, so we can build any truck. And that interface we're building all these trucks can connect into the Plus system. So if you want to have a day, day cab or an overnight cab, uh, two or three uh, uh, trailers and so on, you can just add that in. And what we secure, what we connect with the Plus system is that the customer come to us and ask for an autonomous vehicle, and we secure that it's homologated. So they don't have to go to one provider getting a vehicle and another provider going with the driver. Right. You need to have, as our customers normally say, one, one throat to joke, and that would be us then in this case. So, Sean, the, the module we're talking about, the autonomous module, if I'm not mistaken, uses a suite of technologies, including cameras, radar, and LiDAR. It's, it's uh, the state of the art in terms of making trucks run autonomously. And you are nearing commercial grade version of your, of your powertrain. That's correct. So, so we call this product SuperDrive. You can see a video of that in testing there where, with a safety driver behind the wheel. Uh, but what it does is it enables vehicles equipped within radar, LiDAR, and cameras to operate autonomously from the, a, a customer depot to the highway, down the highway to a depot on the other side. And these, these videos we're seeing, th this is actually on the road in Texas, in Sweden, in Germany right now, right? That, that's correct. So, so we're, we're in testing across those different regions. And the, the video that you can see behind us here uh, is some of that testing in Texas. Now, I was reading that there's a number of reasons to do this. One, it's going to be a lot safer. And the other is we have an enormous shortage of uh, truck drivers. Three million, I think, was the worldwide. Three million truck drivers. So this is addressing a very critical need in that sense. Maybe, uh, Peter, you could address that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the problems. Every, everything we do is uh, about transportation. I mean, we have the clothes on the body, it's transported. What we eat is transported. And that need is increasing day by day. But the shortage of drivers is increasing day by day. And on a global scale, as you said, it's three million drivers that we're lacking. So we need to address that to secure that we're actually doing that autonomous instead. And when we go autonomous, it's also easy to go electrification. Uh, so we can go both more sustainable, because the autonomous driver will uh, use less, less uh, energy, and it will drive safer as well. So then we can address the, both the, the uh, sustainability part, but also that, the lack of drivers. Yeah, it's fascinating. I understand that, that the path to being on the road in a few years went through some other areas, like maybe agriculture and also mining. I know you're doing mining operations. In that sense, the, the, the route is what they call geofenced. It's, it's easier to do, but we're, we're reaching beyond that now. We, we, we've sort of done the geofence bit, and now we're moving on to actual on the road. And uh, what, what I understand, Sean, is that this is legal in all the southeastern states of the United States right now. So you could be operating autonomous truck routes without a driver. Oh, let me make this very clear. 2027 is when we're talking about without a safety driver. This is a vehicle operating autonomously on the highway by itself, right? That, that's correct. So across the U.S., uh, testing and deployment is legal in most states. 
um, pretty much most states aside from California. And so in particular across the Sun Belt of the US, which is a major freight corridor across the southern part of the country, um, there it is uh, legal to, to deploy autonomous trucks. Uh, and so that's why it's one of the initial major target markets. Um, and actually in Europe as well, there's also uh, been a, uh, there's an opportunity in terms of deployment there across many of the major countries across Central Europe. Uh, are, it's currently permitted to operate autonomously as well. I should point out that PLUS was the first operator to deliver freight across the country in 2019. And Sean just told me the cargo was butter, which I found pretty interesting. I assume it was a refrigerated truck. It would make sense. But uh, Peter, let me ask you, um, to just to look forward a little bit, and I know you, you talked about how you can deploy, you can deliver to customer a regular version of the truck or one that's uh, got Plus's technology on it. You have an idea of, so let's say 2030, what the mix of that might be? Yeah, what we're seeing is that in, in, the, in the time frame on 2030, uh, I would say around about, it's a market uh, a penetration of around about 10 to 15 percent, uh, if not higher, but we, we're going on, on a low side. Uh, so what we believe is that it will also increase quite rapidly after that, because what you see, it's not just, as I said, the sustainability part, it's also the efficiency of, of the driver and also securing that you can utilize the vehicle in a much uh, better sense because the human driver needs to rest and the digital don't. So you can use a vehicle in a much more efficient way and uh, for a bigger percentage of, of the day. So by 2030, we, we see that level, but it might go quicker. And moving up to 2040, it will be uh, a, a big incentive to, to continue to do autonomous. And you had mentioned to me that the regulatory picture in Europe is something like two or three years behind the U.S. in terms of allowing this. Will that, will that delay the, the ramp up in Europe considerably? I, I think Europe, and Sean, you correct me if you have a different view, yes. <laughs> but I think uh, Europe is actually two or three years after. Um, it's may, mainly because of, of legislation. Uh, and I don't say that Europe is... is uh, bad, but we have a, a complicated situation with different countries doing different things. So today we have a corridor between Sweden, Germany, France and Spain that you can drive. But today it we, we need to have a approval from the Swedish authorities, German authorities, French authorities separately. We can't just drive through. So well, it's, it's similar in the States, though. You have to have state approval, right? Yeah, but the, the approval process is much easier in oh, the U.S. Okay. than it's in, 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 in Europe. So by that, it, the creating the corridor is harder in, in, in Europe. And that's for testing. Then we need to go when we actually do the operations fully autonomous without a safety driver. And that's a process as well. And we see... Then, of course, it's also about the, um, the situation. I mean, if you go in, in the southern part of, of US, the road network is, is very suitable to drive autonomous. Mm. Meanwhile, if you go in the German autobahn, it's, it's not as suitable. Uh, you come with a car in 260k an hour, uh, then it's more tricky. Now, when we talk about big semi trucks, electrifying them is harder. It's at sub. Uh, Tesla claims that it's, gotten, it's starting to put these semi-trucks on the road. A number of other companies have. But it's harder when, you, when you're trying to do any kind of long distance with an electric truck. Um, one thing you mentioned to me, which I find fascinating, is that it, the driver shortage dictates using bigger trucks with more load in them because you don't have enough drivers. But uh, if, you, if you don't have to worry about that, if you've got the... Uh, uh, automatic pilot, doesn't that mean you could use smaller trucks and maybe they would be electric? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, of course we, we want to use electric vehicles. Uh, I mean, the sustainability is, is core of everything. And, and uh, using the plus drive, we can also utilize the efficiency of that drive. Uh, but also, if you have a human driver, you have a period of time you can drive. For, in Europe, for example, you can just drive for four and a half hours. Then you need to have a rest. So then you get a, a constraint of time, which will create a, that you actually want to drive faster. And then you create more, uh, need more energy. And with autonomous, you can say, 
I can be half an hour later because I don't need to take the rest. So you can slow down and save energy. Yeah, and it's important to note that as a virtual driver, the, the SuperDrive system can drive any drivetrain, right? Whether that's uh, diesel, conventional trucks, or electrified trucks. John, I was wondering, uh, you look at 2027, it's a big goal, it's coming up fast, you must have a lot of work to do to get there. Um, are you looking beyond that? And what, what's your vision for 2030 for the company? I, so, so we have a long-term plan, yes. And I think an important part is from that initial launch, it will be then about scaling up the scale of operations and growing the network. So the, so the initial launch, we focused on a certain specific ODD or operational domain on specific routes. Uh, and it will be important to grow that over time, both in terms of grow the weather conditions and operating conditions under which uh, you, can, you can run these vehicles autonomously, as well as expanding that network from the initial routes to a much broader network that can run autonomously. It's, it's sort of becoming apparent that the autonomous truck is ahead of the autonomous car. And it does seem to me that the challenges of the autonomous truck are not as big, they're not as insurmountable as with a car. But how far do you think the trucks are ahead of the cars? I mean, in terms of trucks versus cars, that's always, always the question. I mean, I, I think I, I would look at it a few ways. So one is that um, the, the operating domain of the trucks is slightly simpler. So, so it's, this is an extremely challenging problem. Um, but I agree with you that it's a much more tractable problem to solve the ability to operate on highways and short distance off highway to the different depots. Uh, and so that's why we've been focused on this from the very beginning. Uh, and I think that this is also a space where the, the trucking market is huge. And so there, with, given the driver shortage and the, also the interest in improving the safety of operation of these vehicles, mm. there's a tremendous opportunity to build a, a really large autonomous freight network across both U.S. and Europe. Yeah, um, one thing people always bring up when they talk about barriers to autonomy are Weather conditions, like do they work? Does it work in snow? Does it work in really heavy rain? And also unexpected situations like uh, a, a, a switch man refer, trying to physically tell you to go into that lane or that lane or signage. And I have the idea you've actually addressed this at this point. I, I mean, have, have you thought of every possible permutation of this kind of thing? So, so the goal is to design for as many possible permutations as possible and then have a system that generalizes well enough to recognize when there's something that's outside of that, that ODD. So for example, if something really unusual happened that we had not designed and tested for, it's really a problem not of deciding you know, how to fully handle that situation. It's about how to safely pull over to the side of the road so that you don't engage in that situation. So it's about seeing far enough ahead to avoid any problematic situations and, and move to the side. Now, that said, I think, um, the, of course, the universe of things that have been seen continues to grow, and the universe of scenarios that you can handle continues to grow. And that goes back to earlier your question on what happens 2027 to 2030 and beyond. It's about continuing to grow all the scenarios that you can comfortably and safely handle such that you don't have to pull over to the side of the road when you encounter something new. Now, here's a, a question that I think I sort of have to ask at this particular conference is, does AI enable you to compute all the scenarios better, or quicker, or faster? Certainly. So, so it's really been the, the developments in AI that have enabled this whole, whole, whole field and capability set. Uh, and in particular, one of the things that has made us able to deliver on the type of timeline we're talking about now have been the latest advancements in terms of, of providing more end-to-end -end learning type systems and generative AI systems. It's with that type of technology, generative AI, for example, how you're able to then generate all the a broader set of permutations and scenarios from the data you've collected to make sure that you can test more and more things, the things that you haven't even seen in the real world yet, uh, and the ability to have these, these systems that generalize well across new conditions. So really, AI, I think, is, has been the critical component that really enables these types of systems to safely deploy on-road. Peter, I imagine you, you talk to fleet operators, and they're, I, I'm really curious of what their reaction to this is. Are they, re, are they really eager to get their hands on autonomous trucks, address the, tr the shortage of drivers? And uh, are they already, are you doing pre-orders at all, or is that still in the future. It's a little bit too early for pre-orders, but of course we have the, the fortune that 
we work with all these customers already today with, with manual vehicles. And most of them are, are, are ready. The, the big fleets are ready, especially in, in the US, where most of them already tried out uh, autonomous vehicles with the safety driver and, and also are ready to which routes they're going to drive, with which goods they're going to drive. Uh, so, and they have teams working with, with autonomy uh, to be able to be prepared because it's not just about the, 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 uh, the uh, software and the vehicle, it's actually how you integrate into the customer TMS system so they can operate because today you have a dialogue with the driver saying where to go and so on. Tomorrow you will have that dialogue with the computer instead. So you need to integrate into the customer system to be able to communicate to the new driver. I heard you say in your earlier presentation that the, uh, the fleet operators are buying not only the vehicle, but the driver, or in this case, the digital driver. So you're solving that problem for them by providing a, a digital assistant that they actually drive the car. It's one way of looking at it, addressing their problems, right? Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I think that's uh, the, the key of, of everything. I mean, first of all, we today deliver a lot of, of, of vehicles around the globe, uh, but it's not just about the vehicle because you can't compare a truck with a passenger car because you buy your passenger car based on emotions a lot. Sure, emotions. totally. It's, uh, so, but a truck is actually a tool and it needs to be up and running 24 seven, otherwise you lose money. And that is what you need to secure, that the vehicle and the software need and to be... the digital driver does not take coffee breaks or yeah. <laughs> doesn't need to sleep. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it seems that we're moving into this future very quickly. And uh, what kind of, just maybe we only have about a minute left. What kind of initially, we're looking maybe the southeastern United States, how long are the routes likely to be initially? Will they get longer, or are we talking a few hundred miles initially? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the initial routes, you can kind of think of this as providing a, an almost new intermodal capability, right, for the mid-distance. And so it's between major cities uh, where you would normally be running the truck for a day or half a day right. are really kind of the optimal route sizes. Uh, and then that, that network will then continue to grow. So it's mostly highway driving, not all of it, but most of it. Mostly highway, yes. So, so the goal is it will operate from a, a, a distribution hub to the highway. So there's some local driving involved, but the majority of the truck's time is spent on highway. We're out of time. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Sean. That was, that was great. I think it's exciting. We're moving into this future now yeah. after talking about it for a while. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here.